passage today is coming from the Gospel of John. You want to turn with me to John chapter 17. I tried to get into this a little bit last week. We're going to finish up the chapter today. As I mentioned last week, it's a, a prayer, a great prayer referred to many times as the high priestly prayer of Jesus or the farewell prayer of Jesus right before his arrest, given on the night of his arrest. Split into three parts, the first being a prayer for himself, knowing what was coming up, a prayer of consecration. The second being a prayer to his immediate disciples, for them to have strength and courage. And, and then the last section, which we'll spend more time on today, is a prayer for those who would come to believe in Christ Jesus through the testimony of those close disciples. And that is a large number of folks that includes us today. Us today. So John 17, verses 13 through 26. And now I'm coming to you. I have told them many things while I was with them, so they would be filled with my joy. I have given them your word, and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not. I'm not asking that you take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They are not part of this world any more than I am. Make them pure and holy by teaching them your words of truth. And as you sent me into the world, I'm sending them into the world, and I give myself entirely to you, so they also might be entirely yours. <clears throat> I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me because of their testimony. My prayer for all of them is that they will be one, just as you and I are one, Father. That just as you are in me and I am in you, so they will be in us and the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me so that they may be one as we are, I and them and you and me all being perfected into one. Then the world will know that you sent me and will understand that you love them as much as you love me. Father, I want these whom you've given me to be with me so they can see my glory. You gave me the glory because you loved me even before the world began. O oh, righteous Father, the world doesn't know you, but I do. And these disciples know you sent me. And I have revealed you to them and will keep on revealing you. I will do this so that your love for me may be in them and I in them. The word of the Lord. <coughs> Occasionally there are times when um, we make purchases that are kind of above and beyond that that you're usually used to making, talking about major purchases, like, you know, originally thought about putting a house in there, but house doesn't really fit to the illustration as well. Like, maybe a car, a uh, heavy, or a, an appliance for the home, dishwasher, refrigerator, those aren't cheap. Some tools are pretty expensive and people need tools. And, and um, for me, it'd be, absolutely necessary electronic equipment that I can't live without. Um, but now, some of these things are necessary and we have to buy them. I know when I started seminary two years ago, I had to get a new laptop. I had one, but it was probably 10 years old. Since I'm doing everything online, I knew I'd be using it, using it to connect to class. If I didn't have a good laptop, I couldn't really participate. And then to research and do all the good stuff, paper writing I needed to do. And Lord knows I've used that computer pretty hard and heavy over two years. Now for purchases that we make like this, there's often provided with that purchase a warranty. Either provided with it or you're given the grand opportunity to purchase an extended warranty. Now, this is a good thing. I'm not talking about you know items that might be of lower price. I've gone through the line at Walmart or Target buy a $25 coffee pot, and then at the end, do you want the extended service plan? <coughs> What's that? 
Why would I spend $19 to extend whatever service plan there is on just a plain, simple drip copy maker? So no, I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about for these major purchases. The warranties that we receive on those provide the purchaser with, with some things that are positive or good. And, and I'll mention three. Peace of mind. If you've got a warranty, I, I do a lot of photography and I've bought some lenses that weren't cheap and and when you're out taking pictures, anything could happen, you could drop one. But the last lens I bought like that, <coughs> I made sure I got a three-year warranty on it. Um, had to pay a little extra for that, but, but it gives me peace of mind. If I drop that lens and make it unusable, I've got you know that that peace of mind that I can send it back and get it fixed. And it's a whole lot cheaper than I could have done. And then warranties also provide us with some kind of sense of quality a quality assurance. The better the warranty is on something, that's the manufacturer or maker saying, I have confidence in what I've made and what I'm sending you. And then support. <coughs> Excuse me. And this one's a big one, especially if you're into a lot of, doing a lot of electronic stuff. And the, the support is there if you have problems setting something up or if you have trouble later on when you're trying to use it. Um, some of these warranties with support offer you know, a chat helpline or a phone call or you know, all these different things. And that one becomes really good if you're able to call for that support 24 hours a day, anytime, night or day. So I say all that <coughs> to get to our passage. I want to talk about Jesus. In our passage, as we, we, we look at the whole chapter 17, we see how much Jesus loves his disciples, how much he loves those people who will come to believe because of his disciples. But we also see how much the disciples rely on Jesus and how much the believers rely on Jesus. And we also see in verse 26, which is our vocal, our, our focal passage, Jesus has revealed God unto both the disciples and the believers. And not only has he revealed God to them, he says, I will continue to do so. I will continue to do so. In a sense, I'm looking at this, and just in a very small sense, and I'll tell you why not completely. I see what's going on here. It's kind of like, you know, when we talk about a warranty. Jesus is, is providing those three elements for his disciples and his believers. Peace of mind. And we see that in other passages as well. We definitely know that the eternal and abundant life that's provided by Christ is of the highest quality. And, and God knows this. Christ knows this. So there you've got that as well. And then the third element we mentioned was that of support. Um, you know, injecting some externals here. We all have times where life gets a little bit difficult. A death in the family, an illness, broken leg, need for surgery. Something happens to a child. Or, you know, different things can happen. You know, it's these times that we can turn to, to the Lord in a special way saying, I need help. I need help. There's things going on here that I can't really handle on my own. I don't know what to do. I've got a decision to make. I can't make it without your assistance. And I think what in this passage Jesus is letting us know that he is available at all times. He's there because he's revealing God to us and he continues to do that throughout. Now I do want to say this, that Using that analogy of a warranty is not that great. It, it falls short in a couple of ways. One, unlike the warranty situation, this great thing that we have, eternal life in Jesus Christ, we didn't buy it. You know, it's not like a washer or a dryer. We didn't buy it. It was purchased 
for us, but it was a gift to us. It was purchased with the precious blood of Jesus Christ and then given to us because of grace. So it, it kind of falls through a little bit there. Another thing that makes it different than a warranty is I mentioned uh, support. Uh, when does somebody call customer support on an item they've purchased? When they've got a problem. Or when they're setting it up and don't know how, which is also a problem. You know, with Jesus, we are not to limit our contact or our communication to him whenever we just have a problem. You know, Jesus is there revealing God to us at all times, continuing to do so. We need to have our hearts open and reveal what we have going on to Christ, whether it's good, whether it's bad, and not just wait for the bad time. And, you know, I'm up here stepping on my own toes because you see me move around a lot. I just, it, this is coming to me as I prepare for the, the sermon, but that's one of the points that I wanted to make. <clears throat> and then, the last point I want to make about the warranty, and then we'll kind of get off that. I told you, like that warranty for my lens, it was a three-year warranty. And so as you get closer to that three years, you're looking at the day, checking it out. And it never fails when you've got a warranty. Everybody's nodding. When you drop it and break it and go back and look, your warranty expired the day before or week before. So that, that doesn't happen. But, but here's the thing with Christ. There is no date upon which Christ's guarantee to us of eternal life, abundant life, eternal life with Christ, with God in heaven. There's no end date to that warranty. I hate using that term. But like I said, it, it seemed to fit in what I wanted to talk about. I wanted to make sure that we saw the difference. In the words of Christ, I have revealed you to them, and I will keep on revealing you. To put this another way, the revelation of God in Christ Jesus unto a believer is ongoing throughout the course of our lives. <clears throat> so the rest of the time, I want us to talk about how God reveals, or how Jesus reveals God to us. Why does Jesus reveal God to us? And then what's our response to be to that revelation? But most important, if you walk out of here and don't remember anything but one thing, it's Jesus assures us that he never ceases revealing God to us throughout our lives. First things first, what do we, what do we mean by Jesus revealing God? I think this one's fairly simple. The, it, talking about to reveal, it just means to, to make known. And typically we're talking about something someone doesn't know, and turning that into something they do know. And I've got two examples real quick. I like, like the artist who paints pictures of the United States president. Not that there's one artist that has done that for 200 years, but you know, the different ones that have, that have painted Typically, that work, they don't want anybody to see it until they're finished. When it's done, they make a big hoo-ha of it, and they put a big white sheet over the top of the painting or whatever. You've probably seen stuff like this before. And then ripping the sheet off. That way, everybody that sees it for the first time saw it together for the first time. And now it's revealed. You didn't know what that picture was going to look like. The sheet comes off, and now you know. It's a reveal. And then one I know everybody's familiar with if you're on social, social media, but even if you're not, it's the gender reveal. People are going to have a baby. And typically these involve incredibly dangerous apparatuses, or apparatus, or whatever, that will either pop or explode with some confetti or smoke that comes out either blue or pink. So you know the couple's going to have a child. You don't know what the sex is going to be. The smoke or confetti comes out. Now you know there's the reveal. So that's those are kind of the examples of how you reveal something. So what 
That's what Jesus is doing for us in revealing God. And this is the reason I mentioned we didn't know and now we know. Jesus is providing to us in his constant revelation of God something about God's character, God's nature, or God's will for his people that we did not already know. It's happening. That revelation is coming. You know, it starts with salvation in general, but then throughout our lives, Jesus still has, through the Holy Spirit, new revelation of God for us. And I think that's a key sometimes. I, don't, I haven't thought about that at times, but in other times, I am reminded painfully that God is always revealing to us something new, something we need. So now how does God, or how does Jesus reveal God to us? Well, when we talk about revelation and in general, we've talked about the general revelation, just the, the looking at the planet, looking at the stars, that that in and of itself, according to the word of God, is what we have called general revelation. You can't look at that stuff. You can't go out to the Grand Canyon. You can't go to the Appalachians or, or look up at the stars. Without knowing deep in your heart there is a God. It has to be that. So that's what we theologians term that general revelation. Even though that points to a God, what it does not do, it does not give us any specific indication of the plan of salvation. You know, we can't look at Niagara Falls and, and from that ascertain the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so where does that come from? Scripture. It comes from Scripture. That is special revelation. <clears throat> so when we think about those two types of revelation, and now we look at how does Jesus reveal God to us? How do we, how do, we do it? One, we can read Scripture. Two, this is not the kind of revelation I'm thinking that we get from nature walks, although God can still talk to us there. But I think the primary method is what I'm going to take it at. That when I was in law school, I had completed a year and got my first law-related job in Lexington, Kentucky, running titles. Anybody familiar with that term, running titles? Okay. Um, I'd never done it before. Wasn't really familiar with the process, but I did find out it's a pretty serious thing. What happens if you're gonna, if you're gonna buy a piece of property and contact your bank and make an offer, the bank is gonna contact their lawyers who in turn get their clerk or paralegal to go check the title chain. And, and we end up going back and I think oftentimes when I was doing it, we went back 60 years in researching to make sure that the people who said they own the property really own the property. You want to buy a piece of property from someone who doesn't own it, <laughs> that's going to be a problem. And the second thing, the bank wants to make sure that there's not some other person or institution or government that has a claim filed against that property. Tax lien or a mortgage from another financial institution. So a lot of people don't, but I found that to be incredibly exciting work. Loved it. Thought I'd never forget this lawyer's name that hired me. I did, I forgot it. I tore myself up this week trying to think about it, getting on Google, and, but, but it was so long ago that didn't help. But anyway, he spent about a week with me at the courthouse, Fayette County Courthouse in Lexington, down in what they call the vault. That's where they sealed off and kept all these records and documents. And he spent a week going through teaching me what all these like deed books from all the deed books that go back. I mean, you get to the point where you've got microfiche of these ancient handwritten deeds, and it's super interesting. Of course, my history was in, or my major was history in college, so this was a lot of fun for me. So then we get done with all of that. I mean, <coughs> the point I'm trying to make, because I was about to get into talking about that so much that I was going to lose track, because I really enjoyed the deeds. He spent a week going through, doing the work, the 
and me sh shadowing him. The way I learned was by example, following in his steps, seeing what he did, seeing what books he pulled, when he pulled, what was important, what notes he took. I took tons of notes. And so this, I think, is the major way Jesus reveals God to us. And by revealing God, Jesus provides to us information about the character, the nature, and the will of God. He does this by providing that example. He did that for his disciples. He still does it for us today. But it, there's one extra element added for us, and that is we have to read it. The accounts of his interactions with other people, his compassion, his love, the miracles, his confrontations with those who were opposed to this new and crazy message of love, forgiveness, freedom from oppression. They're all contained within the New Testament. The ones that we need to know and we need to read. So that's, if you can tell, first and foremost, that's my favorite and primary method of the revelation of God by Jesus Christ. I have revealed you to them, and I will keep on revealing you. Now let's back up a little bit. Let's say when this lawyer, whose name I can't remember, I'm sorry, took me down to the vault, teaching me how to do this, how do you think things would have gone if I kicked back and walked off whenever I saw somebody down there in the clerk's office, the, hey, Paul, the law school chaplain, go over and start talking to him, say, I'll be right back, you know, and he'd come back a few minutes later. Or if I found a nice, nicely lit corner in there and, and went over and sat down and started reading the newspaper. You know, I, that lawyer would start questioning his having hired me to begin with. If I didn't lose my job for that kind of behavior immediately, I would lose some credibility within the eyes of that attorney. He's going to doubt my trustworthiness to the firm or my ability to do what I need to do. If I continue to work for him, he's not going to trust me with the more important projects. Those things that mean the most. And here, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, I want to contribute to this firm. But I've kind of messed that up based on that attitude. I think we can apply this one for one to the Christian life. The revelation is there. We have an opportunity to, in Bible reading, devotionals, prayers, worship, to take advantage of this education, of this revelation that Jesus continues to give to us each and every day through the course of our lives. <coughs> if we don't do our part in eating that up, just letting that information grow us, then like the lawyer, will not God start to wonder about our loyalty to the firm, about our desire to grow the kingdom of God. And I do not want to be disqualified from whatever big project God has out there for me to be a part of, to help bring about and stretch out his kingdom to give other people the kind of belief that they need, the kind of love that they need that Jesus has shown them. So now let's talk about a different method of, is it different? This is just another way probably of saying what we've already talked about. Jesus reveals God to us on a daily basis, moment by moment, through the Holy Spirit. It's Pentecost. What a better day than today to talk about the role of the Holy Spirit in this revelation. <clears throat> in chapter 14 of John's Gospel, Jesus says, If you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. 
He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Yes, Jesus is with us. He's with us in the form of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and this is done with the passage now. I didn't want to, didn't want to give the impression that what I was saying was still part of what I was reading. But Jesus is present, and we can feel that presence through the Holy Spirit. We can pick up the revelation that is intended for us through the Holy Spirit. This is a permanent thing. This is a continual thing, continuous. Jesus praying to God, I have revealed you to them, and to them is us, and I will continue to do so. It wasn't a one and done thing. A couple of observations about Revelation. You know, when I said, talked about reveal being something that we didn't know, and now we do know. That's the reveal. We didn't know what the picture was going to look like. Now we do. We didn't know what the baby was going to be. Now we do. So you might think, well, once it's revealed, I don't need that to be revealed to me anymore because I remember. However, sometimes on specific topics, we are, information about God is revealed to us, and yet, we still need future revelation on the same thing. And it, maybe it's not revelation. Maybe a better word for this now is reminder. This is when the Holy Spirit is convicting us, reminding us, you know what you should have done in that circumstance. You know you shouldn't have said that, what you just said. You know, those convictions of the Holy Spirit it's still revelation, but it's not revelation of a new thing as much as it is a reminder of the decision we made to make Jesus Christ our Lord. Our Lord to rule our behavior, our hearts. So that's, that's another observation about the revelation. And one final, <clears throat> and this one, it came to me late, but I really liked it. When we read in the Bible that Jesus said, I have revealed you to them, and I will continue to do so. When you think about that a little longer than I did the first few times I read it, it tells me that there is not one single minute I will spend on this planet in which I can say I've got it all figured out. I know everything there is to know about God, because if that were the case, Jesus would no longer need to reveal anything to me about God. And in a way, this is comforting to me. Because we don't have to feel like I need to learn everything there is to know about God. We can't do it. It wasn't intended for us to be able to do it. Doesn't mean we don't try to understand as much as Jesus reveals to us, as much as the scriptures reveal to us, as much as we know from our Christian traditions, this is a relationship. It is a relationship between father and child, brother and brother. You know, we are all one family under God, one family in Christ Jesus. So that's the that's last observation about reveal. You know, when we have questions about our faith, about life, even though I was saying earlier we should constantly be in an attempt to find out what is it Jesus wants to reveal to me about God today. There are going to be those times when we have really major stresses. There's nothing wrong with just saying, with acknowledging you need help, with acknowledging that 
It's not that you don't know everything there is to know about God. Right now, I feel like I don't know anything. And there have been those times. It can be as simple as just saying, Jesus, help me. Jesus, help me. Because that's, that's the relationship we have. And Jesus does not sleep, has no need for it, is always present. The Holy Spirit is not just hanging around like an ambulance down the street in a subdivision waiting for a call. It's the Holy Spirit is in us all the time. So we just ask for help. And there's nothing wrong with that. And, and we just need to be open to what it is that that revelation might be. The Holy Spirit is never going to convict you or try to convince you of anything that is inconsistent with the truth of Scripture. So that, that, that kind of, that, that always made me wonder when you, you might have 200 people here saying, well, the Holy Spirit has told me X. And the person over here saying something 100% different. You know, run those things through the filter of Scripture, and then we'll find out. But I'm not really worried about what the Holy Spirit's telling somebody else. I just need to be listening to what the Holy Spirit's telling me. Let's get back on. Let me get back on track on that. And when we find ourselves in need, nothing wrong with letting the Lord know that now would be a good time. I'm listening. We need to accept what we hear within this revelation from Jesus. We need to be attentive to his teaching and learn from him. We need to enjoy the peace that such union with the divine provides. And then we do not neglect to share with others the gospel of grace in Jesus Christ. Yes, the revelation of God in Christ Jesus unto a believer is ongoing throughout the course of their life. And thanks be to God for that. Because I know I'll never reach a point in my life when I don't need to hear from God. Amen. Our hymn of invitation today is 387. Holy Spirit, thou art welcome. 387. <laughs> church in every race and nation by the mystery of Pentecost that we celebrate on this day. Pour out the gifts of the Holy Spirit on all humanity and fulfill now in the hearts of your faithful what you accomplished when the gospel was first preached on earth. May we be receptive to the ever-present revelation of your character, your nature, your will as revealed by Christ Jesus our Lord. To our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>